have uh, Roman, who's going to talk about building an open source online learning to rank engine. Um, Roman is an independent search engineer working on relevancy, personalization, and recommendations. A pragmatic fan of open source software. Sounds like my kind of guy. Uh, functional programming, learning to rank models, and performance tuning. So please give Roman a large round of applause. So, hello, my name is Grebenikov Roman, and today we're going to talk about MetaRank. It's an open source uh, learn to rank system. So this is me. I will later explain why I'm screaming. So uh, just try different uh, career paths, be doing a bit of academia, a bit of quant trading, credit scoring, last a couple of years and working in the area of search and personalization and relevancy, uh, mostly in e-commerce. And uh, right now I'm crazy enough to work full time doing open source. Uh, so uh, and the talk itself is uh, ra about ranking, more like a just gen generalized term of ranking. So the conference is, of course, about search, but uh, ranking can be seen through prism of others, other use cases. Like you have a layout of collection. It's like search, but there is no search query. Or you have recommendations. It's also like search, but instead of a textual query, you have a contextual query of a product and finding something similar to this product. It's not only about e-commerce, but content sites, it's the same thing. And it's not only about static ranking, some dynamic algorithmical feeds changing in real time. It's also about ranking. So you might say that learn rank is not on a hype anymore it's not a vector search uh, but still probably because uh, such things are getting commoditized and uh, it's not uh, so it's not like just about early adopters but it's just early majority using trying to use it and i took part in a couple of projects uh, do, um, improving ranking in different verticals and it usually starts like this so you try to do something uh, like a low hanging fruits. So for example, tuned field weights, because there is a tooling for that. There is no way of doing it. You can do it, do it quickly and maybe just play a bit with the weights, do an A-B test, play a bit, play again, A-B test or not A-B test, like a virtual visual A-B test. You open your search, just see that it looks good and assume that the A-B test succeeded. Uh, but actually tuning, even tuning weights for for Elasticsearch, it's actually a machine learning problem. So you are optimizing some metric of some black box system by uh, tuning the parameters. So you can use actual machine learning tooling for that. There is the learn to rank area of machine learning to solve this particular problem. Um, and the A-B tests of just random tuning of field weights usually take a lot of time. And the more weights you have, the more parameters you add in your ranking formula, the more fragile it becomes. So you tune yet another weight today and break some keys you tuned for one month ago. Um, but going all in for machine learning and uh, doing MLOps and all that stuff is kind of risky for traditional companies because you need to go all in. To, to do this machine learning pipeline set up MLOps and uh, A-B tests. And it's, it's, sometimes it's a bit hard. Uh, so and it's a long project. So we need to invest in it. And uh, there is still a risk that it won't succeed. And uh, you, it's just scary to, 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 to go to, to the unknown. Uh, so, but... Um, if you multiply like BM25 with click-through rate, it gives you quick feedback. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work, but still it takes like five minutes to do and five days of A-B test to validate it's working or not. And going all in for a learn to rank is not giving you quick feedback because you do something for half a year with your team and at the end you fail. And then what happens with your manager? Probably nothing good. Uh, and usually the same story happened with vector search. Um, so actually the BERT model, the different libraries for approximate nearest neighbors are quite old. You can do that, could do vector search four years ago, but you probably didn't because there was no tooling. You just need, needed to glue a different libraries, open source projects together to make it work, to validate, to integrate them together in corner cases. And maybe at the end you will succeed or not succeed because you don't know what will be the result. 
Uh, right now, there are tooling. You just download something, run it, and in five days, you might get that it was not, not, not going to work with you or whatever, but just five days and not five months. And the learn to rank is itself uh, still a high risk investment because from, from my opinion, it's just about tooling. So you need some experience and in, in your team. You, you, we did a couple of interviews with, with teams doing uh, learn to rank projects in, in the industry. And we got this number of like approximately the first A-B test is kind of five, six months. And, and more for a first successful A-B test. Uh, so because, and for most of the time, people spend time doing tooling, gluing things together, and maybe just a couple of weeks finally running XGBoost on the data you collected. Uh, there is a wonderful paper, quite, uh, quite old, but quite famous, about the hidden technical depth and machine learning system. Uh, so the machine learning part is actually the very small part here. And all the data scientists try to go there, but there is a lot of vast variety of things around you need to do to make it work. And for my also own opinion is that current solutions are not covering that much of this area. So you can do a bit of machine learning, a bit of feature extraction, a bit of serving, and all other parts are covered by your team, which is not always good. Uh, and Every time, and that's the reason why I was screaming there. So it's like doing the same thing again and again, like doing click through rate for fifth time is kind of repetitive task. Everyone has like a click through rate, probably if you're doing something on a web. There is a lot of typical things people do again and again, like user agent parsing, query field matching to do some weights, some item metadata, different counters, rates, tracking visitor profile. It's usually the same thing. And from the data perspective, from MLOps perspective, the data setup is also kind of usually the same, at least it's converging into some known solutions. Uh, so the data model is the same. If you're on web, there are clicks, impressions. You need to do some feature engineering. You need to compute them, uh, serve them, log them, and, and like do some judgment list processing to do some replay of the uh, change logs of the, your features back in time if you need to validate something offline or recompute some features if you implemented them wrong. And usually people slap Lambda Mart on top because it's kind of the first step in learn to rank uh, journey. There are probably better models, but like the first step is usually Lambda Mart. So, uh, and it would be great if there will be a wonderful system trying to expand out of this ML core to other areas and solving the most painful points. So it's not like, uh, um, so it won't solve everything, like 80%, 90%, but with, with a short period of time. So in a week, you can understand that learn to rank is not going to work for you or going to work, but not in a half a year. So that's how MetaRank was built. So it's kind of a very generic tool trying to solve most boring and most uh, common parts of learn to rank data processing and data engineering. So it's not only about machine learning, it's mostly around machine learning, doing some data stuff. So MetaRank is not a retrieval system. It's like a rare anchor. So you still need to have some candidates fed to it. So imagine you have some search, you get some top end candidates from the search and then feed it to MetaRank to do a ranking. So it's kind of the, these two parts, two steps are optimizing for different things like uh, precision. So MetaRank is for precision search for a call. So you're trying to get more relevant candidates on the first step and making them more precise on the second step. So, uh, and it's still inside it's also kind of a boring architecture. So we have, uh, you need to have some traffic history describing what your visitors were doing before and you throw it to the meta rank. It processes all this, it, it tries to replay the traffic history and rebuild the, all the machine learning features, but not like, like back in time. So that you will get some sort of a change log of uh, your ranking factors back in time. Uh, the same feature store is used to produce this implicit judgments for training machine learning model, your training model, and switch online. So it's the same code, but just running with a different source. The 
on offline, it's just a dumps of your traffic history. On online, it's just real time events. But it's the same code writing to the, through the same flow to the same feature store, but just for the inference to produce better ranking. It's open source Apache 2, single jar file, so you don't need Kubernetes cluster to play. And to start using MetaRank, there will be a live demo. Live demo is always like a circus, someone probably going to die. Um, so you need your historical events. You can take it from somewhere else. Uh, then you just map your historical events into the ranking factors. I will also explain how. Train your Lambda Mark model. We have two supported backends, probably more soon. And to just switch to the online mode to do an inference. So it should be quite easy. Uh, MetaRank has a strict data model. We tried to see what are other data models across the industry. There are GCP retail events, segment IO spec about e-commerce, but they are very narrow in the case of industry. So you won't fit it into the social network, for example. So we tried to use, to make like a very, very generic and simple uh, spec of events you feed into the MetaRank. So it's a metadata event about your visitor or about your item. So what known prior about this item. So if you're going in e-commerce, it's like item price, some tags. If you have CRM about your returning customers, you can set some acquisition channels or whatever you know about your customers. But um, there is an impression event, like every time visitor sees a search result in a particular ranking, you emit this impression event that this user viewed these items at that time. For example, like search results, collections, or maybe recommendations widgets, it's not important to which particular list, which particular implementation was used for listing, just the list. And when user decided to interact with an item, like clicked or like, or do a mouse hover, we've seen also cases when people emit this interaction events when item goes into the viewport in the browser. So it also can be used like this. And just the example is just a JSON, so nothing fancy. Uh, for it's a metadata example about the item called product one. There is a timestamp because we don't store like anatomical values of uh, fields, but more like they are changes in time. And we have a couple of free format fields about title, price, color, and uh, partial updates are okay. So you don't need to send title every time your availability changes, for example. Uh, when a visitor does something, uh, sees a ranking, you need this ranking event. You, there is a user and session here and some items in order they were displayed. You can optionally send some information about the first step scores of your rankers, of your retrieval system, like BM25 score or cosine similarity from your neural search. Uh, if you're going search, you can also send the query as just a field. So it's trying to be as generic as possible. And when you do, uh -huh. and when you do a click, that's like a, this user clicked on the, within the session, did this type of interaction. There can be multiple of them over this item and some optional fields. So that's the whole data model. Probably it can be banned into any area. Uh, we're going to do some sort of a demo. And for the demo, we'll do a movie recommender. So it's based on a rank lens data set. We, we, that's what we did. So the rank lens data set is just a fused data set of movie lens and TeamDB for metadata. And some real user uh, interactions and rankings uh, taken through the Toloka platform. So we did this movies, clustered them, and then these clusters were some random samples from these clusters were shown to users. And they tried to like particular items. What do they do? What do you like from this cluster? Uh, so that's the example of the metadata event for Toy Story 3, probably. Yeah, and uh, that's the example of the ranking event. So we displayed this movies to the user. This one is the user ID, and that's what he this user liked. That's it. Uh, we also transformed it into the schema of uh, MetaRank like this. So it's 
for the movie this one we have this type of field some numerical fields some categorical fields some string fields and so on uh, every time we displayed something to the user we also have this ranking event we don't have any relevancy because like there was no true relevancy it was just randomly ranked and when user clicked on an item we just made a click event so that's all the events we did and uh, let's go back to slides uh, and then when you have the data set ready describing your click-through histories you need to map this click-through histories and events into the actual ranking factors and usually people start writing a giant uh, ton of python code to compute these rankings and usually this python code is quite repetitive in from the business perspective so we try to implement some most common Mm, feature extractors. We call it feature extractors just to map the something from event to the actual numerical machine learning feature. These features are later tracked in the feature store, so there are change logs for them, and uh, we can also uh, serve them in the latest value in real time while doing inference. Uh, so just a couple of examples how these feature extractors work. So you have this numerical field budget, and you can just map it to the number of the, your as a numerical feature in the machine learning model, just a number. There can be some a bit more complicated, uh, like mapping a low cardinality string, like a category or genre to some number of one hot encoded numbers. Uh, some special transformations like parsing user agent and extracting something like a platform from there, and also one hot encoding it into numbers. It can be also do with browsers, operating systems, bot detection, all that stuff. You can do counters. So with this interaction count, you count uh, interactions of type clicks for each item. Uh, but this is a global counter, so it won't work if you your inventory constantly updates. There are some new items added. So you can go with the window counter. So it's like a rolling window thing that rolls over time and counts something like interactions for this case clicks. So we have a bucket of 24 hours. We have 714, like one, two, four, eight weeks of this counter, so this windows. And we recompute these counters every one hour. So it's kind of cumbersome to implement in Python in a streaming fashion, but we spend some time doing it and it seems to work. Uh, you can also not just track counters, but divide counters together. So if you divide uh, clicks to impressions, then you will get a click through rate or dividing purchases to clicks, you will get conversion. So that's how it works. It's also a rolling window with different sizes of windows, a, a refreshing every once in a while. And we also do some sort of rate normalization. So in case if you have one click and two impressions, I was impressed by the talk by Rene somewhere here. Yeah, so that's your idea. <laughs> Uh, so there's some rate normalization. Uh, we, you can do some customer profiling. So for each user, we track all the colors user clicked in, in the past and every time and uh, intersects this profile of clicked colors with each item you're ranking. So if your user likes something red and the item is red, you probably might signal the model that, okay, that's a signal user likes red and model decides what to do. Uh, and you do some more typical things like ESLTR plugin by like field matching, Lucene, Ngram, whatever. And uh, the mapping is actually the most probably complicated part of this. So you need to write this giant configuration file like here. So for example, we took all the numbers we have in our data set. Uh, we do some like word count in the title because maybe longer titles are not clicked or vice versa. We one hot encode genres, we do some click through rates, we'll track uh, clicked genres, actors, tags, directors, some global counters, because why not? We also do some sort of a hacky position bias elimination. So it's a special type of column. It's not like our invention. So there is an article with this one about position bias learning framework. So this uh, the idea is that you introduce a feature uh, equal to the position of the item in your machine learning model. The model learns how position affects ranking. And then on inference, you don't feed the position there, but feed a constant. Like all your items from the machine learning model perspective are on the same position. 
so like a hockey way, but uh, on other smarter papers about position bias elimination, it's usually used as a baseline, but still it's super easy to implement and it's quite a strong baseline like BM25. Uh, so that's it. We have our configuration ready. So some training stuff here and we can try to import the thing. Uh, uh, sorry for Java, but still, if you have run it, you will get some a long list of things you can feed it with, uh, and it's import config config data events, and that's it. So something started to happen, probably. Oh, so it will so you show you some sort of progress. Uh, what actually is happening right now? Let's go back to slides while it's importing. What is actually happening? So we're trying to replay the whole click-through history from users and computing this feature value snapshots in time. So it's like a change logs of features. Some features are updated in real time, like your customer profile. You clicked on red, it's immediately refreshed. Something is update once in a while, like click-through rates for items, like once an hour. And we are just going and updating them back in time. And at the same time, we run some sort of a click, some, like a time window to join click throughs. So when we see the ranking, uh, when we see the ranking here, uh, we collect the actual snapshot of all the feature values back in time. So they are not just the click through rate right now, but click through rate two months ago on this item and uh, wait for clicks and purchases for a couple of minutes, like 30 minutes by default, and then emit this click through down the stream and then from this click through having the feature values back in time the items which were displayed and the features which were confused to produce this ranking we do this some sort of implicit judgment so there are items there are features there are feedback on this item so, so this item was examined this was clicked we have no idea what happened with this but we still sample it as a negative and then we feed it into the lambda mark and oh it's done so the second part of our circus is to train the model uh all the clicks through all the click throughs are also stored in right now it's in redis it just pulled from there or they're refreshed in real time so it's still the same streaming oh we started training something and and done. So probably because of the, there's just a lot of debugging information here, but the most important part is the Shapley scores like this, the weight one. So the importance of different features in the rankings. So we see that position bias is quite strong there. Uh, the like gener is very, very important from the ranking perspective. Other like runtime is a bit less. Title length is not that much. And after that, uh, actually, if you're lazy enough to do this train, and then we can just go serving and sending our requests to just serve. Uh, and that's it, you can send requests. If you're lazy enough to run everything sequentially, there is a standalone mode with an in-memory. So just to play a bit, you can just remove Redis here and, and it will do the same thing, but in memory and match faster. Stand alone. That's it. Uh, it will just replay, do it everything in memory, and you can retrain the model, and you can start sending requests right in time. Uh, there is also a cool thing. Uh, yeah, so it will be training now. Uh, there's also a cool thing we did about uh, this configuration file because it takes some time. You need to read docs, and no one likes reading docs. People like going immediately to ranking. Uh, we have some sort of a set of heuristics to generate a, date, a feature mapping for you based on the document, based on your data sets. So it looks like this, and so you don't need config for that. Out of here, out again, and that's it. Oh no, probably ah the letter. 
So it's just importing and generated some sort of a feature mapping. That's again YAML. That's a lot of different things. You need to like uh, still read the docs, but just based on hints from the from the ranker itself that it might be. You, if you have a low cardinality fields, you can map these fields, for example, like one hot encoded or whatever. Just track this profile history. So that's it. Let's go back to the. Uh, standalone mode and send a couple of requests there. Uh, yeah, sending requests. That's the. Uh, we have a couple of requests ready to to send. So there is a ranking request, just some set of movies for user Alice, and then we have a click made on a specific item by this user, and then we just send this ranking twice to see, it's not sent, uh, ask uh, MetaRank to rank this ranking twice without feedback. So it would be won't, won't be personalized. And then after we give the feedback and it will change in real time, like magic. Uh, did we, yes, we already did surf. Let's, uh, let's do it like this. Send ranking event to the local host. Rank uh, the boost. The boost is just the name of the model. You can have multiple ones like this. Oh, yeah. So it sent us some sort of, it returned us the same items, but in a different ordering, probably with some scores. Let's just take a couple of them to with us just to check what will happen. Uh, then we're going to send the same ranking event as a feedback. So like a feedback and that's it. So it was accepted, everything is fine. Then we're going to send a click. So we did a click on some item, what will happen? Something happened, we updated six machine learning fields ranking features under the hood. And let's send this ranking event for a ranking again and see what happened with our scores. And they should probably update uh, comparing to the old ones. Yeah, so you see the top results are completely different. This one, 72998, drifted somewhere to the bottom for some reason, but I don't know. Uh, actually, the thing we're doing is uh, you, there, there is a visual uh, thing, the, there is a visual UI to play a bit with the same data set. It's the same tooling setup. So this is the movies, we can go to sci-fi. Uh, there are actually the features used for the ranking here. And you, for example, I like Man in Black. I click on that, ranking updated, more space movies right now, which is wonderful. And you can see why it was ranked like this. So probably because of gender, you can have more features, but it's just a demo. So that's the whole demo. Uh, but it's not only about personalization. So if you have this interacted with customer profile tracking, uh, you get dynamic ranking. We once had a pilot when marketing department insisted that there will be constant ranking for everyone so they can prove that it matches their mental model on how ranking should look like. We, they were not able to explain this mental model, but they know it. Uh, so it's some sort of a static pre-compute ranking. You can do, do it through MetaRank or just dump it into your database to use for ranking. And it's not only about re-ranking. Right now, MetaRank is just a secondary ranker. We also found that when you st start speaking about personalization, people start wondering that, okay, it's recommendations. Like, no, you need to write some Python to get recommendations with MetaRank. So it was always a surprising thing for us. So we plan to implement some basic recommendations retrieval with some matrix factorizations, no neural networks right now, and um, maybe do some sort of merchandising because merchant, so re-ranking and learn to rank is that when you trust, trust the machine, uh, there is a machine, small one, uh, but uh, not all the people trusting machine enough. So they want to do some random improvements to the ranking based on their mental model, they probably cannot explain to the machine learning engineers. So it's good to give people some uh, ways to control the ranking, to do some business level improvements like, okay, I trust your machine learning model, but please promote red items a bit to the top because Christmas is coming like this. Uh, so MetaRank is not covering everything from this diagram, but it's trying to cover as much as 
it would be useful for people. So it's just doing a bit of a data collection. There is event schema connectors for existing systems. Uh, we have oh, we have validation heuristics. So not the whole demo done. Sorry, guys and, and girls. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so um, if you did uh, validate and if you do this like this, it will give you a couple of hints. What did you wrong with your data? So for example, there are some pass, pass like um, and okay. Well, there are some failures here. So 96 interactions happened on items with no metadata. So, and these are the IDs of these items. And so we plan to implement more of these validators, but they are usually catching a lot of corner cases in existing production data sets. We do only Lambda Mart, so it's not that much, and some feature extraction. <clears throat> so we tried also to build it like cloud native by design. So from the Kubernetes perspective, it's just a single stateless deployment. Uh, it can easily like scale up, down, nothing state, no coordination. Uh, all the state is sitting in Redis. We do plan to have something else, not all Redis, because sometimes it's not cost effective to run Redis if you have a long history of user interactions. You want to track customer profile for five years, for example. So it might be expensive. So like Postgres and Redis, Postgres for cold data, Redis for hot data. You can also like retrain the model in real time. So there is like an API, XGBoost slash train, and it will just pull all this uh, click throughs and train the model and try to deploy it everywhere. And you can serve multiple models at the same time. And uh, actually it's not the first time I'm talking about MetroRank, but all the time it was like an MVP. So there was always fires, a lot of different issues. And right now it's kind of calmed down. So there are a couple of, pilot projects, people are using it in production. You can run it in distributed node. We're doing some integrations with the different data collection systems like Snowplow, maybe Segment in the future. And we have a giant backlog of tasks we want to implement in the future, uh, but uh, we have no idea where to start. So that's why I came here. So actually the meta rank was built to solve our old pain. So I want need to write click through implementation yet again for the for the ranking system so but probably it might be useful also for you so we're looking for feedback so as it's, it's an open source project you can go to github and just read the docs and say uh, what we should do next there is a long list of ideas if you are out of your ideas and if you are having some sort of unique case we came from e-commerce originally we planned to have it as an mostly targeted for e-commerce, but surprisingly found that all our pilot projects are not from e-commerce, like zero one from e-commerce. I don't know why, but probably because e-commerce is much more densely packed with solutions, consultants, and so on. And if you're doing some niche social network, what plugin for Shopify are you going to use? I have no idea. Or maybe you're usually doing a to-do list app for project managers and how are you going to, in which existing tool a SaaS service you're going to integrate. There are no tools for to-do list apps. So we're trying to go to be a bit more diverse. Uh, so it's on a GitHub. We have a community Slack. You can ask us questions, follow us on LinkedIn. We do some random posting there. Star us on GitHub. And that's it. Hopefully you have some questions. Fantastic. Thank you, Roman. Um, so uh, just a quick uh, shout out to our online folks. Do uh, type a question in the Zoom chat and we'll ask it uh, on your behalf. But do we have any questions for Roman? Yes. Hi. Uh, hello. Ah. Thank you for the presentation. It was a lot to consume, honestly. <laughs> and you spit through to all of it. So thank you. My question is about, if I understand correctly, this uh, will always benefit the items that are uh, being interacted more, right? If it's being, if there's more data regarding an item, if it's clicked more, or if it's related, related to something that's been clicked more, it's always gonna be boosted. So uh, first, is this assumption correct? Uh, second, if not, if it is, sorry, uh is there a way to boost the underdogs 
under what? I mean, the, uh, unclick once or like ah, things that so I, I want it. to promote. So basically. it's actually, it's not, there is no silver bullet. So it's up to you how you do your setup ranking. For example, you can drop this feature with popularity and vote count and, and just have some static features like budget and release date, runtime, title length, or maybe genres. And then it won't, it won't know about item popularity, so it cannot boost item popularity. So it's up to you how you define your ranking. So it's not like a black box system. So uh, when you trust some sort of SaaS provider, you send your, throw your data through the wall, some magic happened and you get your rankings. What happened, you don't know. Uh, here you do because you set up how it ranks. So technically you can, if you think that there is some sort of a popularity bias in the ranking, we're also considering implementing some, so we did this position bias elimination technique from this paper, but it can also be used for popularity bias elimination. So you uh, mark this feature as a popularity of the item, but on the inference stage, you put a constant there, like a median value of popularity of all the items. So model will think that these items in the ranking are having the same popularity. How will I rank it? So then you will do some easy bias, like popularity bias elimination, but it's just up to you, you control. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got a question from our online audience. Uh, Dmitry Belyev asks, um, have you tried to attribute um, item impressions without interactions? Uh, one, uh, a user saw an item one time and didn't click or order it. Or two, the same user saw the item 10 times and didn't click or order it. But he saw that, like from quantum physics, he interacted. So when the item was in the viewport, you did your interaction. So you can emit this interaction like, okay, the, there was an item in the viewport and you can account for that later. Okay. I hope that answers your question, Dimitri. So I, want, I, have, I have one question. I think when you have a model in production, you have like a 50% of the work done. Uh, sorry, you can hear me now. Uh, can you repeat, please? Yeah. So I think, when you have a model in production, now you have like 50% of the work done for machine learning. And the other part of the 50% of the work is actually monitoring. And what I find a little bit difficult, I, I, or I didn't see is actually that in the meta, you have actually the logic no, for the clicks and all the information. How do you get this data to monitor actually the input data that you are giving to the model? No, Also the output data you are get, uh, getting from the model, no, uh, and also also something maybe for me it will be important i didn't see how to find it it's actually uh, how do you versionize the models no and how do you get this information so i think and i think but i think at the end you mentioned no, that this is something yeah, that's I missing how in the you versionize the model like uh there is model and you versionize it like this okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's an that's the name of the model not the type yeah so we are, don't do explicit model versioning but you still can do it in a like simple way and the most important, how do you get actually the data no, that you're using it? Because I think the, all the data logic is actually in the meta rank, no? And yeah. I would like to have the data logic also in my, something in my uh, database so that I can know that actually if something goes wrong, no? If my clicks actually, yeah. there so is a data drift. It's so a data drift, yes. Yeah. So I can show you a ticket in our GitHub, like, so you might guess that there is nothing for that implemented. We plan to do, but it also depends on the needs. So not many people are speaking about that. So it's kind of a second stage. The, the meta rank itself is like half year old. So first release working somehow a bit, not only on my laptop was around March or April. So not everything is done. So in the future, probably. Yeah, but still the, the data is in Redis. So you can go there, like select, uh, I don't know, two, and go there and with your oh, keys. And that's a lot of stuff going on there. So you can just go and it's like, right, right now it's just JSONs. So you can just take this JSONs and see with your own eyes what's going on. But we do plan to export this uh, change log histories to some external systems so you can slice and dice it later. So you can get not only this feature change logs inside of the meta rank, but also outside of the meta rank. 
So we'll click through like click through histories for items and so on. So that's the plan also to exposing some real time metrics about current statistics of uh, used features for feature drift detection, like through Prometheus or something. There is also a ticket for that, but right now nothing. Okay. Well, one more question. Yes, please. Hi, thanks for the talk, first of all. Um, this, this model relies heavily on historical data and also on the uh, result sets that are being returned by your search engine, let's say Elasticsearch. What if you drastically change your Elasticsearch queries and your results for given queries change a lot? Does that affect the model at all? Do you need to retrain it? Do you need to tell it after this date? I have changed the result sets and now please act differently. Yeah, so you need to retrain. There is an option in config file to do retraining from a specific point in time. So everything before, just throw away. So yes, you should probably retrain. Yes, it's easy with this tool, so. I think we've got time for one more question. Okay, okay. I try to ask it quickly. So I understand that there is a, there are these features based on the events, uh, you know, clicks, interactions, and stuff like that. There are static features, and then there is like you also mentioned that you know the the baseline should come from Sol Solar, Elasticsearch, or, or Vespa, or the like. And it's I, in the example it shows that it brings one uh, number back. So there's one pretty much query dependent feature is like BM25 or whatever. My question is, can the the baseline uh, from the, the search engine, the top N, you know, can it brings multiple uh, query dependent features because like you no know, even that uh, feature engineering sometimes problematic there might be you know much on the title with this analyzer or maybe on other field with other analyzer and can it support even multiple query dependent features so you can inject them as a part of the ranking if this uh, query dependent so here are just no fields you can do something here just some matching but it would be scoped to the query not to the item query to inject something to the item query i have no idea how but it can be a good idea but the typical thing if you want to intersect your query and your particular field in the document you can just emit this document as a metadata and just show meta rank that this field exists and there is a I don't know how it's called for the text. That's a field match field extractor that just interacts two fields, one from ranking, one from the item. It's not like a complete BM25 because we don't track term frequencies across the whole index because it's kind of complicated. Uh, but some like ngram or just token in intersection union to token intersection, just dividing them together. So it's some sort of estimation of things you can do inside of Elasticsearch. So like a poor man's uh, field uh, BM25 matching. Okay. Yeah. So we're, we're gonna leave it there. Um, thank you very much, Roman. Thank you.